Is nationalism, in your opinion, also something that stems from insecurity? One way to understand nationalism is that nationalism is about hating foreigners and hating minorities, and it's us versus them. And I think this, is, this stems from insecurity, and it da, da, does terrible things to the world. You did talk about how we will reach a point where AI will be able to hack a human. Yes. What does it mean to hack a human being? It means to understand me better than I understand myself. To be able to predict my feelings, my thoughts, my, my choices, and increasingly also to manipulate them. If a corporation can use my behavior online or offline to be able to guess what to sell me, yeah. thereby sort of manipulating my decisions, can this be used politically in the future? Absolutely, it can be done in politics just as it's done in commerce. And that's a huge danger because, you know, the whole of democratic politics is based on the idea that the government obeys the will of the voters. And that's good, but what happens if the government can manipulate the will of the voters? Then it's like a, a, a closed circle. With over 40 million copies sold and books translated into 65 languages, this is a New York Times best-selling author who stole the story of the human race from the past, the possibilities of the future, and has now begun to tell that same story for children. Yuval Noah Harari is a best-selling author and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this Thank conversation. You. Welcome to it's India. To it's a pleasure to, to be able to sit down with you. I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> questions are good. <laughs> so, my first question to you is, um, what future do you expect to see in the year 2050 for the human race? It completely depends on our decisions. I don't think that there is anything deterministic about the human future. Um, you know, you have the worst case scenarios when we actually destroy human civilization by making stupid decisions uh, uh, destroying the ecological system, engaging in more and more destructive wars, not regulating dangerous technologies like AI, within 20 or 30 years, we could destroy human civilization. Or we can choose wisely. We can choose to cooperate in order to prevent climate change, in order to resolve international tensions, in order to regulate uh, artificial intelligence and bioengineering, and then we can have the best time ever in, in human history. I don't, I, I think that history is never deterministic. And we do have examples from history of people making good and wise decisions. We have managed to overcome things like famine. We have managed to uh, uh, develop medicine to a degree that we can prevent most epidemics, most diseases. Um, recent years uh, have been the most peaceful era in human history. Um, so we are capable of making good decisions, but it's, it's our choice. So you did talk about the fact that, you know, we've overcome famine, we've overcome a lot of disease. Um, medical science has made great strides in the last um, 200 years or so. Yeah. Do you expect the future to be about feeding hungry children and eradicating diseases and making sure everyone is collectively looked after? Mm -hmm. Or is it seeming more now like it's going to be about becoming richer and richer? Mm. Corporations that are more and more powerful, that control more data, uh, the race to be the richest man in the world, is mm. that likely to be, more likely to be the future? Again, I'm um, I don't think it's deterministic. It's completely in our hands. This is why one of the reasons that I chose to uh, uh, write a book for children, because to a large extent, the future of, of humanity is in their hands. And the main message of the whole book of Unstoppable Us is that uh, people made the world what it is, and people can change it. The way that the world is constructed right now, the political system, the economic system, it, it was not determined by the laws of nature. Humans constructed this system. And if there is something you don't like about it, if it doesn't work in some way, we can change it. It's not easy, of course, 
but it has been done many times before and it can be done again. You've also said that you, uh, you believe that a lot of the wisdom that our children have is intergenerational. The fact that they think there are monsters under their bed yeah. is, is because of where the human race has come from. Explain that to us. Yes, yeah, so um, you know, history is critical for understanding who I am right now because much of my behavior, my feelings, they are shaped by hundreds of thousands of years of history. If, uh, uh, as a kid, I wake up in the middle of the night afraid that there is a monster under a bed, this is actually a memory from thousands and thousands of years ago when people lived in the wild, in the forest, in the savanna, and there were monsters that came to eat kids at night, like a tiger would come to eat you, and if you wake up in fear and call your mom or run away, you can survive. So uh, for a 10-year-old kid today to understand that uh, my fear of monsters, it's not something wrong with me. This is actually a kind of wisdom I got from my ancestors. That's important. But it's also important to understand that a lot of the wisdom of the ancestors is less relevant today. Because today, you know, tigers... In some places, they are still a, a, a danger, but most kids in the world, they have very little chance of ever encountering a tiger anywhere except in a zoo. In some places, they are still dangerous, but in most places, not. Um, kids, in, 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 on the other hand, encounter every day uh, other dangers that they are not adapted to dealing with. For one obvious example is cars. A lot more people are afraid of tigers or snakes than they are of cars, which is strange in a way, because, you know, how many people get eaten by tigers every year? Just a few. But cars kill every year more than a million people. But we are not adapted to being afraid of cars. So we need to teach kids for a long time how to be careful on the road, because it's not built into them. And, it's, and there are other dangers, for instance, like corporations. And there were no corporations like Google or Facebook or whatever uh, in the savannah 100,000 years ago. There were tigers. Now, uh, corporations can pose much bigger threats to us. But um, just to explain what it is, just to understand what is a corporation, it's very difficult. So, you know, you have lots of, of books for kids about tigers and elephants and, and whales and things like that, which is important. But we also need to explain to 10-year-old kids what is a corporation and how to be careful when you're dealing with a corporation because they deal with corporations every day of their life. Every day they meet Facebook, they meet Google, they meet McDonald's, they meet Coca-Cola, and they need to understand what is this thing. And how should I beware of some of the dangers involved? How should I, should I use it for my benefit? So one of the things I, uh, that we do in the book, in Unstoppable Us, is exactly that. To explain to 10-year-olds what is a corporation. So you did talk about the fact that a lot of um, you know, the wisdom that children have, uh, or the instinct that they have, is intergenerational uh, memories. Given the fact that we're looking at a future that involves climate change, that involves global warming, that involves artificial intelligence and yeah. big corporations, is there any part of the past of the human race that will prepare our children for what is coming? Um, well, I think that the, the past is still extremely relevant because, you know, history is not just the story of the past. History is the story of change, how things change. And this is extremely important right now because the pace of change is accelerating. So um, understanding, you know, and understanding how people built the world and how they can change it is crucial for making better choices. And the most important thing is to understand that you can change. Even things that look very old, that look like eternal and natural. You can change them quite quickly. Do you believe that humans can make collectively good decisions? I mean, as an individual, we're wired to make a decision for survival. Yeah. But as a collective, can we decide? Can we make good decisions? 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's more difficult because it's much more complex. Just to understand that is the danger you face, it's difficult. Like again, you see, you see a tiger, you understand immediately, this is dangerous, you run away or you, you hide somewhere. But uh, when we are facing with something like climate change, uh, collectively, we are running towards it instead of running away from it. We are still haven't changed the way that our economy or our political system is built to, to, to protect ourselves from it. So this is much more difficult. But again, it, it can be done. Because uh, to give a historical example, you know, uh, in 1945, humans acquired the ability for the first time in history to completely destroy themselves with nuclear weapons. Until 1945, even the kind of worst people in the world, the biggest conquerors, uh, the, 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 uh, the biggest armies, whether it's Genghis Khan or whether it's Napoleon, they couldn't destroy humanity. They could kill millions, but they couldn't destroy humanity. 1945, you get the power to destroy the whole of human civilization. And um, a lot of people were pessimistic, saying that this is the end. We don't have the wisdom to prevent the Third World War. Uh, but so far, I don't know what will happen next week with you know, Putin and all that, but so far, we have managed to avoid the, the Third World War. And actually, since the invention of nuclear weapons, international relations changed in a fundamental way. Since 1945, there has not been a single direct war between superpowers. And actually, all kinds of wars, or most kinds of wars, uh, uh, um, declined. We don't have any case since 1945 of one country being completely destroyed, wiped off the map by the invasion of another country. This was very common before 1945, became very rare, almost non-existent afterwards. Again, there is no guarantee that we will continue to make the right decisions. The problem with war and peace is that to make peace, you need a lot of wise people to cooperate. To make war, sometimes you need just one stupid person to start the war. There is an imbalance there. And so the danger is always there. We, we need to keep making the effort. Now with the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine, we are in danger of sliding into maybe a nuclear war, another world war. So again, I don't know what will happen in the future. But when I look at the last 70 years or so, I think we should be not optimistic, we should be realistic and acknowledge we can make good decisions. So uh, we don't need to rely on some divine miracle to save us. We don't need to despair, oh, this is all over, humanity is going to its doom. It means we need to be responsible. I do want to talk to you also about AI because yes. it's become, I mean, from the time you wrote about it to where we are now, it seems closer yeah, to the things you wrote. Fast. It's moving fast. Um, you did talk about how we will reach a point where AI will be able to hack a human. Yes. Do you see that now far closer? And are yeah. we already there? Could you it's, explain it's to us? I mean, yes. The idea of hacking human, we are used to talking about hacking computers, and yes. smartphones, and yes. things like that. But we are increasingly seeing corporations, governments, acquiring the ability to hack a human being. What does it mean to hack a human being? It means to understand me better than I understand myself. To be able to predict my feelings, my thoughts, my, my choices, and increasingly also to manipulate them. Because if you can predict my feelings and choices, you also know how to manipulate me. Uh, what do you need in order to, to, to do this? You need a lot of data, a lot of information, and a lot of computing power. Yes. Now, previously in history, nobody had that. Even if you think about somebody like Stalin in the Soviet Union, he wanted to follow everybody all the time. But he couldn't. couldn't. He didn't have the technology. In the Soviet Union, you can put a KGB agent to follow somebody all the day. But there are 200 million people in the Soviet Union. You don't have 200 million KGB agents. And even if you do have 200 million agents, um, what do they do? They, wrote, they follow me all day, they write a report at the end of the day on some piece of paper, they send it to headquarters in Moscow, 
somebody needs to read 200 million papers every day and, and interpret them. what that means yes it's impossible yes so it was impossible to hack all everybody like this now it is becoming possible you don't need a KGB agent to follow you you have the agent in your own pocket your smartphone your computer somebody else's computer or smartphone follows you collects data on you all the time and also you don't need human analysts to read all these papers you have algorithms that analyze the information so it is possible now for the first time in history to completely annihilate privacy to follow everybody all the time to know more about me than I know about myself and this is very frightening, this is extremely dangerous. You know, it can be used for some good purposes, like providing us with better health care, alerting us, look, there is this disease starting, let's try to take care of it when it's still very easy. Mm. But it can be used to create the worst totalitarian regimes in human history, something far more extreme than anything we have seen in the Soviet Union or in communist China or in Nazi Germany. Uh, again, it's not inevitable, it's not a prophecy. We can prevent it by uh, uh, making the right regulations, uh, by building the right technologies. That's one of the biggest choices we face as, as humans today. And again, it's especially important that the young people are aware of it, mm. because you know they are very often online all the time, all their social life. And, they should realize that all this immense amount of information on me, I'm giving it yes. to these corporations or to the government. And what will they do with it? And also, it's not just the information I give, it's also the information I take in. That uh, we are now flooded by enormous amounts of information, which again, AI and algorithms, are kind of, 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 of manipulating, using it to manipulate how we think. You know, it's, it's like, you know, like you play piano. So now these algorithms are learning how to play on our emotional system, hmm. how to generate hatred, how to generate fear in people's minds. So, you know, people are sometimes very careful about what they eat, the food that goes into their body. They should be equally careful about what they feed their minds. We need an information diet for the mind. You know, like you, you buy this, this piece of food and it says you, this is like 40% sugar and 20% fat. If you want to put it in your body, okay, that's your choice, but at least you know what yeah. you're doing. When it's something like this, for all these, you know, videos and, and, and tweets and things like they should have this warning. This is 40% hatred. 20% greed. If you want to feed your mind greed and hatred, okay, what can we do? Yeah. Maybe we need some regulation on that also, but at least you know yeah. that this is what you're doing to your mind. They keep say, telling us that data is the new oil. Yeah. I mean, oil remains a massive evil. But <laughs> yeah. And there's a, there's a question of how much you said data we're giving governments, how much data we're giving corporations, and how they can use it um, in the future or even now, even uh, now, to sell us things or to figure out what we like and to be able to play on what we like in order to sell us things that they want to sell us. If this is the truth, and if a corporation can use my behavior online or offline to be able to guess what to sell me, yeah. thereby sort of manipulating my decisions, can this be used politically in the future? Mm. And what will be the quality of our democracies if that is true? <coughs> Absolutely, it can be done in politics just as it's done in commerce. And that's a huge danger because, you know, the whole of democratic politics is based on the idea that the government obeys the will of the voters. And that's good, but what happens if the government can manipulate the will of the voters? Then it's like a, a, a closed circle. That yes, it obeys the will, but it was the government itself which manipulated this will in the first place. And, um, you know, I get this question a lot about what is left from human free will with all this technology. And the most important thing people should understand about freedom is that freedom is not something you have. Freedom is something you need to struggle for. 
It's something you need to develop. If you go around feeling, I have free will, anything I choose, my, uh, 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 my food, my dress, my politician, this is my free will, you're the easiest person to manipulate. Because you have no curiosity about where do my desires come from. You have this fantasy that, I don't know, you have some tiny free will inside your head, and you just choose whatever you want freely. If this is the case, there is nothing to investigate. The answer to every question, why did you choose this? It's my free will. In reality, we know, and this is not something new, this has been happening throughout human history. Many of our choices, our desires, they are influenced by cultural factors, by political campaigns of propaganda, by biological processes in our body. If you really want freedom, you need to be curious about the process that shapes your desires, your choices, and how to be more careful about all these kinds of manipulations. So um, I think we, there is still scope for human freedom, but it starts with being curious about what really shapes our decisions. Only then can we retain real freedom. I, I think it's fascinating you've begun writing these books. It's one out of four volumes. One's yeah. out already. We're waiting for the other three. Um, should we also, given everything we're looking at in the future, be teaching our children something different at this point? Or will mathematics and, and you know, um, social mm -hmm. sciences that we've been teaching children up till now, will that do? Oh, you know, they're still important, of course. But I think that... Um, we are facing kind of bigger and bigger choices as human beings. We are now responsible for the whole ecological system. We are also gaining the ability to change our bodies and to change our mind in ways that were never possible before. So this turns a lot of very old, you know, philosophical and spiritual questions into practical questions. Um, and I think this means that we need to give more attention to things like philosophy, like history, like spirituality in the education of young people, but to understand them correctly. It's not, you know, religion. Religion is the, is that, the exact... That could go wrong religion. Yes, religion is the exact opposite. Religion is when you, you have some story and you force people to believe in it. You're not allowed to question this story. Like you teach kids, this is the way it is. You are not allowed to question it. If you have any doubt, this is bad, you'll be punished. This yeah, is it, very dangerous. Also, those stories are largely based on faith. You have to just believe you that just this have could have happened. Exactly. Um, what actually we need is the ability to question these big stories and to learn how to distinguish between something which is based on evidence and something which is just a fictional story somebody invented. You know, people are now flooded by enormous amounts of information. In the past, information was scarce. So one of the main things a school provided with kids is simply information. Now they don't need more information. They are flooded by enormous amounts of information. What they really need is the ability to tell the difference between reliable information and unreliable information. And that's true in almost every field. So also in history. How do you tell the difference between a, a, a scientific, evidence-based narrative of history and some story somebody came up with last year or a thousand years ago. And uh, for that, again, there are so many different kinds of evidence in history, whether it's archaeology, whether it's our own genes. You know, you can tell the history of humanity by looking at people's genes. This is, again, one of the things I explore in, in the new book, is what happened when our species, Homo sapiens, encountered Neanderthals, another human species, 
some 50,000 years ago. Previously, it was thought that the Neanderthals were just completely extinct. Now we know from genetical evidence that actually sapiens and Neanderthals interbred. All of us are partly Neanderthal. 50,000 years ago, there was some kid whose father was a Homo sapiens and whose mother was a Neanderthal. And we are all the descendant of that kid. And we know this from genetic evidence. We actually have the genes in us that comes from the Neanderthals. And uh, this is amazing, not just because what it tells about, about the past, but about our identity. You know, with all these debates today about uh, uh, mixed marriages, people from different races or religions getting married and having ch children. What people from different religions? You have people from different species having children together, and these are our ancestors. So what does this tell us about our identity? This is very important. Do you expect um, in the future um, we, we will, you know, as, as our children get older in the future, that we will um, perhaps in order to block out the amount of information that's coming to us, turn mm -hmm. more inward. We've seen a rise in sort of religion, mm -hmm. um, in religions pushing people, this us versus them, on social media, yeah. um, the far right. There, mm -hmm. there is a rise across the world with the rise of social media. Yeah. Um, is that a reaction to the kind of information that we're dealing with, to the kind of problems that we're dealing with, people mm -hmm. sort of going back to maybe faith more than science? Uh, one of the things that we noticed after COVID, people expected a, a you know, more scientific temperament, but mm -hmm. the exact opposite happened. No, it's complicated because you see both phenomena at the same time. We still, at, in, in dealing with COVID, the world, most of the world, even religious leaders, they followed scientific advice. Um, you saw the Pope telling people, don't come to church because this will spread the epidemic, stay at home and uh, uh, conduct services online. So you have people like the, church, like the Pope or like Jewish rabbis and, and Muslim and Hindu leaders following the advice of scientists, which we didn't see a century ago or a thousand years ago. And you know, when the Black Death spread, in the Middle Ages, everybody had their religious and, and astrological theories. Nobody had any idea what was actually happening. Now, almost all the governments in the world adopted the scientific view that this is a virus, this is how it spread, this is how it can be stopped. So we shouldn't be too pessimistic about you know, the, the decline of science or something like that. We do see that a lot of people, you know, again, because of the flood of information, because of the huge challenges we face, people feel very, very insecure. So they want to hold on to something which will give them security, stability. And very often they find it in kind of uh, a religious story or a national story, which claims to be eternal, unchanging. It gives people comfort. Um, unfortunately, it's... Uh, uh, not only doesn't it help us deal with the problems we face, it's not even true. All religions and all nations change again and again throughout history. Something that doesn't change cannot, cannot adapt and cannot survive. So, you know, Judaism today is a completely different religion than what it was 2,000 years ago. You know, 2,000 years ago, you have priests in a temple sacrificing lambs and animals to the sky god. This was Judaism. Now you have people studying texts and arguing about texts in a synagogue. This is Judaism. It changed completely. It happened to every religion. Um, but again, I, I think the most important thing is to understand the difference between religion and spirituality. That religion is a story you are not allowed to doubt or to question. Spirituality is the exact opposite. It's asking some big question about the world, like what is good, or what is the source of suffering, or uh, uh, who am I? 
and not settling for any easy answer, but exploring, going deep within yourself to explore who, who really am I? And I think we need more of that. Is nationalism, in your opinion, also something that stems from insecurity? Mm. That depends what we mean by nationalism. People mean very different things. Um, one way to understand nationalism is that nationalism is about hating foreigners and hating minorities. And it's us versus them. And I think this, is, this stems for insecurity. And it da, da, does terrible things to the world. But I think the real meaning of nationalism is not hating foreigners. It's loving your compatriots. It's caring about the other people in your country. So, you know, to be a good nationalist doesn't mean that you hate foreigners. It means that you pay your taxes honestly so that other people in your country, they get health care and education. The government takes my taxes and uses it to build a hospital on the other side of the country for other people. And this is nationalism. It's about love. It's not about hate. And it also means, therefore, that it, it's not an obstacle to cooperating with foreigners. If there is a global pandemic, a good nationalist should cooperate with people in other countries, exchanging information, getting medicines, vaccines, things like that, because it's easier for humanity to deal with a pandemic when we are united. Similarly, if we are afraid of climate change or of uh, the dangers of artificial intelligence, as a, as a patriot, I should be in favor of cooperating with other countries because I, we can't solve this problem on the level just of our nation. So the problem is not with nationalism. The problem is with certain politicians who tell people a wrong story about nationalism. We see politicians who some of them may be personally corrupt, corrupt. They don't even pay their taxes, but they say, I'm a great patriot because I hate foreigners. And they preach this to, 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 to the voters also. And this is the problem. As long as politicians tell people nationalism is about love, is about being honest, is about paying your taxes, is about uh, not, you know, I don't know, if, if, if I'm a minister and there is an, uh, I need to appoint somebody, or I have a contract to build a new bridge, and I give the contract to my nephew, even though he gave a very high bid, instead of to a stranger who gave a much better bid, this is anti-patriotic. You're preferring the good of your family to the good of the nation. So you want to prove that you're a patriot, you give the contract to the most qualified person, not to your family member. That's, that's, that's the proof, that's the test of how, how patriotic you are. And if politicians would present nationalism in this way, I, I see no problem with it. Do you believe that AI could possibly be the end of humankind? Yes, if we misuse it. So again, AI is not necessarily bad. You know, it's like a knife. You can use a knife to kill somebody. You can use a knife to save, save their life in surgery. It depends on, on your decisions. Similarly, AI, you can use it to save people, people's lives by providing better healthcare, or you can create killer robots and autonomous weapon systems, or you can create a, the worst totalitarian regime in history. So it's our choice. Now, this choice depends not on the AI, it depends on our wisdom and our compassion. So we need to develop our wisdom and compassion in order to make the right choices about AI. If we just say, no, uh, we don't need to develop ourselves, we just have better and better computers, then um, these computers could maybe, I, and I don't believe in this science fiction scenario of the robots rebelling against us to destroy us. That's not the scenario I fear. I, f I much more fear a scenario like, you know, a totalitarian regime in which all the decisions about everybody's lives are taken by some algorithm that nobody understands how it works. It is increasingly starting to happen. Like in some countries today, when you apply to the bank to get a loan, it's not a human being that decides. It's an algorithm that decides whether to give you a loan. We will see this in more and more areas. You apply for a university, for school, for a job, 
uh, and increasingly your fate is in the hands of an algorithm. And this is a much more realistic danger, I think, than of robots running in the street shooting people. So one of the risks that we're already seeing is that the big internet data companies, so the big internet companies, yeah. Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, they function across all countries, almost mm -hmm. all countries. And so each country finds it difficult to regulate them because they're bigger than the country themselves. Mm -hmm. They choose whether or not a yeah. leader of a country, for whatever reason, can have a voice or not have a voice, yeah. or be taken off a platform. Mm -hmm. uh, regulating them also raises questions of free speech. Yeah. If AI is also then controlled by these larger organizations, would it be possible to regulate it at all? Or would it be larger than the governments and larger than, you know, the regulators? Yeah, that, that's a very, very big danger. I think, you know, in previous centuries, there was this problem of colonialism, of a country like Britain coming and conquering India with all the soldiers and guns and taking and exploiting the people here. Now in the 21st century, we are facing a new type of colonialism, which is kind of data colonialism. To control a country, you don't need to send in the soldiers. You don't just need to take out the data. So you imagine, maybe not India, which is a very now big and powerful country, but smaller and weaker countries in the world, uh, if all their data is being taken to China or to the US or to some other big country, and just imagine a scenario in 20 years when all the information, the most personal information, your medical records, your uh, uh, sexual activities, your political views, everything about you is in Beijing or in San Francisco. And this is true not just of you. Every journalist, every politician, every judge, every military officer, there is some, somebody in another country that whole, has all this information. Is it still an independent country? Or did it become a data colony that can be completely manipulated and controlled without sending soldiers? And again, similarly, um, when you control the information, not just the information you take out, also the information you feed in. If people get most of their news from these platforms that are controlled by maybe another government, then again, you don't need to send the soldiers. You can just control people's minds. So it's very important that we are careful about where our data is going and also where, what data we are consuming, what we are putting into our minds. Again, it's not a prophecy that this is inevitable. We can still regulate it. For instance, you know, some very clear guidelines is that if somebody has my data, they can only use it to help me, not to manipulate me. This should be very clear. We have it in other fields. Like my personal doctor has a lot of very sensitive information about me. She is not permitted to sell it to a third party or to use it to manipulate me. She only uses it to help me. It should be the same with the big tech companies. Similarly, very clear guideline that we should never allow all the information to be concentrated in one place. It doesn't matter if this one place is the government or a corporation. This is the road to a dictatorship. When somebody has all the information, they are dictators. And another key guideline, whenever you increase surveillance of individuals, we must simultaneously increase surveillance of the corporations and government. If it only goes one way, they see everything we do, but we don't know anything about them, this is a dictatorship. If it goes both ways, this is safe. So okay, the, the corporation has a lot more data about me. I need to have more information about its business model, about its taxation, does it pay its taxes, honestly, and, and, and where. Similarly, if the government has more information about me, I should simultaneously have more information about the government, the budget. I mean, that there is no corruption, that there is no malpractices. And it can go both ways. You know, the, uh, you can have an app that you can put the name of, I don't know, a government minister and immediately see all the friends and family members they appointed to key jobs 
or gave contracts to. This is something information that technology can do. So as long as it goes both ways, we are safer. Thank you so much for speaking with me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.